As you can see, I'm John Medicaitis. Uh, I've been doing TMJ and EDS patients, TMJ for over 40 years, EDS patients for over 10. And we had, last night, we had a small meeting of EDS patients, we had basically a dozen. And basically what the EDS does compared to what our situation is here is it provides an elasticity. Now, this is me, if you pay attention to that. And this is my disclaimer. Basically, when I actually instruct either other physicians or physical therapists, this tells you basically that I'm not in charge of what you're going to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, the parameters, note that all the syndromes we're going to be explaining, especially with patients that are in a compromised position, as in with Carrie, uh, we want to make sure we rule out all life-threatening conditions. And we're going to introduce to you a, another myofascial pain syndrome, a cervical myofascial pain syndrome that I came up with probably about two years ago that will explain a lot of the ancillary things, especially what Dr. Clayham was talking about, with discomforts as such as sub, uh, suboccipital headaches, frontal headaches, that type of situation that can actually be explained by an alternate means. And the, the basically the cervical myofascial pain syndrome is going to be a combination of the TMJ and the cervical uh, instability syndrome, and they are almost always related. Now, the one situation that we get into and we're going to talk about is, number one, I am not a surgeon, okay? I'm not talking about dura, I'm not talking about patches. What I'm talking about is the stability of the spine and the head and the angulation and the relationship of all this and how it actually interplays one to the other. We're going to find out that, believe it or not, the mandible has a lot to do with the stability of the surgical spine, of the spine itself. Now, let's start by talking about the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and just basically, just for minor information, I will tell you the queen of genetics is next door. It's she's Claire Francomano, so if you want pure information on this, go to her. But actually, what we're talking about is the Ehlers-Danlos is a collagenous syndrome caused by gene sites that are compromised. And then these gene sites, the COLA, COL1A1, 1A2, 3A1, and et cetera, et cetera, are all part of the chromosome number 15. Now, last May, we had an international conference in New York itself, and we actually determined for uh, further areas, we picked up chromosome 13, we also have picked up other gene sites, and right now we're up to 29 gene sites that are compromised that can actually cause this particular situation. Now, the one thing we found for pure uh, diagnostics is that the uh, gene identification is the principal way to go, okay? And we talked about that. Now, the classifications have changed. This is just pure information for people who actually have EDS. But the classifications went from numbers and letter types down to a pure hypermobile, vascular, or connective tissue. So it's VDEDS, HEDS, and CEDS with descriptors on top of that if you're interested. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the TMJ itself. We're going to talk about the, uh, the uh, possibilities of problems that are associated with this. So a normal TMJ for a normal jaw opens. 40 to 55 millimeters. An EDS patient can open up to 75 millimeters. We're talking about baseballs and fists in their mouth. We're talking about hypermobility for the big time. But there's no deviation when the jaw opens. There's no pain associated with opening or chewing. There's no cracking. There's no, no popping in the joint. And the lateral motion of the condyles are lateral one to one and a half millimeters. Now, basically what happens is take your fingers and put them in front of your ears. Okay, now go ahead and open your mouth. Now, if you're normal, the condyles will actually move out a millimeter, millimeter and a half. Most people perceive the fact that this joint is a two-dimensional joint. The uh, reciprocal area and condyle head, they perceive that it's a sliding joint when it's not really, it's a convex joint, concave joint, I'm sorry. So when you open, that condyle actually tracks laterally. When the cartilage displaces, it usually displaces outside and anterior, so that condyle will move down instead of moving out. So if you're moving down instead of moving out, come see me after this because you've got a problem. Okay? Now, 
when you're actually looking at what's not normal, this is interesting. I have this lady's face here just for one specific reason. When I examine patients, I will sit in front of them. And what do I see when I'm sitting in front of this woman? What I'm seeing is, if you look on the right side of her face, the eyeball is higher, the, eyelid, the, uh, the uh, um, eyebrow is higher, the cheek is higher, everything is rotated, and her chin is rotated to the right. Basically, what that's telling me just by looking at her is that I probably have a dislocation of the cartilage on the right-hand side. When she opens, her jaw actually deviates to that right-hand side. Okay, so basically what that means is it makes her unable to chew. Uh, she has popping and cracking in the joint. Uh, she has ear pain, she has itching in the ear, fullness. Um, and one thing we do find, and we're actually gonna talk about a little bit later, is the fact that the same nerve that goes to the posterior portion of the ear goes to the ear canal itself. So the two, con <coughs> pardon me, the uh, symptoms move back and forth. And the one thing we're also gonna talk about is limited cervical motion. What does that mean? We're gonna find out that positioning of the mandible will actually distort the position of the C1 and C2. And that, Dr. Claycamp was talking about, especially with children, when those vertebrae get rotated, it'll actually generate suboccipital head pain and pains that you would actually try sometimes associate with a Chiari when in fact it's being generated by distortion of the position of the mandible. Um, again, and we're gonna have talk about muscle spasms. And when you talk about muscle spasms, these are all the muscles that are associated with the jaw. The closer muscles are the ones that you see, the temporalis, the masseter, the internal pterygoid, and the external pterygoid. Now, if the patient is having sharp pains in and around the ear, chances are there's a spasm in the external pterygoid. Tension, headaches, or pain in the lateral side of the head, it's a spasm in the temporalis muscle. The masseter and or sharp lancating pain to the teeth can actually come from the masseter muscle. Each one of these muscles has a specific area that generates pain, and what they call myofascial pain referral syndromes. Now, there are other muscles underneath the chin, the anterior belly of the digastric, the omohyoid, and the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictors that come from this area that actually are in charge of the opening, but actually, well, as we move along, we're gonna see that the superior pharyngeal constrictor is a major player in this game. We're also talking about the posterior cervical musculature, and this musculature actually helps maintain the craniomandibular posture, which is very critical. And these muscles, the internal oblique, the rectus capitis minor, the trapezius and semispinalis capitis, and the levator. The levator especially is going to be indicative of specific pain syndromes. This is the joint itself, and this is what the EDS patients always talk about. Pain can be generated. There's three nerves that come into this joint the one of which, the deep temporal, which is a branch of the mandibular nerve, gives you most of the sensation and the ear pain, ear fullness and the itching. You have four synovial pockets, synovial membrane pockets, and you actually have four ligaments per side, and each one of those ligaments can actually physically stretch. And when they stretch, they can allow the displacement of that cartilage that we we're talking about. Now, the additional structures, the median collateral ligament, Tanaka's ligament, and the condyles and the mastoid process, et cetera, et cetera, are structures above and around it. But when you look at this area right there, this is the temporomandibular joint ligament. That actually runs from just below your temple to just in front of the ear. That actually holds the joint medially. When you look at this area, this is actually the cartilage that sits between the two. This is the articular eminence, which actually is the end of your cheek. Okay, where it actually physically ends in the joint. This is the posterior laminate area. This posterior laminate area is where the most of the nerves actually sit, and that's where everything is, is uh, the, where most of the pain is generated from. But when this thing opens, rotation around this point is for the first 33 millimeters. As the jaw moves forward, it actually moves down this path, and this condyle and this cartilage will actually come to this point. That's normal motion. That's when you felt it actually physically moving out. And now we talk about the orthokinematic of the joint. This joint technically is what they call a ginglimo orthorial joint, rotating and sliding joint itself. And there are, uh, th again, three dimensions. We're talking about how the jaw actually physically moves out and the synovial joints. 
The central correlation is basically for dentists that I talk to, they all think it's the position of the teeth when it's actually the position of the bones when they come together. But the most important two, sen oops, poor two sentences here are pre and post vertebral musculature determine the jaw position and the cranium mandibular position is a function of the mandibular rest position. In other words, the neck positions the jaw and the jaw positions the neck. They move back and forth. And we're going to find out as they move um, how they actually interplay. We have the neurology and what we're seeing here is the trigeminal nerve runs this entire system. The trigeminal nerve basically is the largest nerve in the head besides the brain. And it basically has three major branches. B1, oops, I keep doing that. You have V1 that comes out at the eyebrow, V2 at the lower crest of the orbit. V3 is actually in the mandible. But keep in mind, motor is V3, the upper two are just sensory. Okay? So this nerve actually supplies not only the anterior belly of the digastric under the chin and all the muscles of mastication, but it also supplies the lateral rectus muscle in the eye. So a lot of times when you have head pain, and or jaw distortion, you'll actually get double vision out of this. So that's one of those uh, determining factors. And of course, we have convergence, convergence problems, as you will see. And then the nociceptive problems, source of the pain is one place, the side of the pain is someplace else. Cervical cranial instability, believe it or not, has to do with head posture. Head posture basically and the, the one phrase that I love is, for every two inches your head comes forward, your head doubles, in, or head doubles in weight. Now basically what happens is iPhones, computers, cell phones generate a lot of strain on the upper neck and back, especially the, the C5-6 area. Uh, mandibular posture actually uh, dictates the position of the neck. The ligaments and length do that, and again, we're talking about the pre and post vertebral musculature and cervical cranial wrist positions are all dictated by the mandibular position. Now, this is probably for more uh, PTs. We're talking about atlas testing and axis testing, but if you talk about the transverse ligament, and that's your no ligament, and the ability of that ligament to actually move that will actually test going side to side. And wh what we find is that if you put your chin to your chest and rotate side to side, you should be able to get 50% of the turn. If you cannot, there's a problem with that ligament and or the insertions, okay? The axis testing basically is the ALR ligament and that goes from C2 to the base of the skull. And that's your side, it's your I don't know ligament. And when you're limited, to motion, usually that tells you that C2 is actually rotated. And when that happens, that will limit your head turn. Um, C2, I feel, is the cornerstone of all the cervical stability. And basically what that means is, is that wherever C2 is, it usually dictates where C1 tracks and where the rotation of the head is tracking. So this is my favorite film, right? Your favorite x-ray, right? Or x-ray. So what we're looking at here is, you're looking at the mouth open. This area right here is the dens of C2. These are the spacing between C1 and C2, okay? This is in position, but look at the occlusal plane, how it's horizontal. Now, you come over here, the vertebrae is actually rotated to the right. See how the space is increased from the dens to there? But look at the position of the mandible. You see how it rotates up? So in other words, the vertebrae is rotated to the right, the dorsal process is to the left, the mandible is actually distorted, and we're going to tell you why that happens. Same thing going the other way. Rotating to the left, space is increased from the dens to the lateral portion of, the, uh, of C1. Look at the mandible, see how it's higher on the right than it is on the left. The position of the mandible will dictate the position of the vertebrae and vice versa. They go back and forth. Again, this is rotation of C1. The only reason I show this to you is because when I'm examining patients, a lot of times I'll go just below the ear, just below the angle of the jaw, and you'll actually find a process that's tender. And usually that's the C1 rotating. As C1 rotates, it'll actually cause that pain in the sternocleidomastoid coming down the side of the throat. 
and it'll actually move forward in the rear of the throat and actually cause breathing problems, especially at night and cause possible sleep apnea. This is for the PTs to actually physically show them the rear arch of C2 and how the dens actually articulates with C1. This is, this picture, I have a lot of fun with this. This is obviously the mouth open. You see this area right in here? That is the anterior arch of C1. As C2 rotates, C1 will come forward. That anterior arch will actually come forward in the rear of the throat. And when you swallow pills and they get stuck or food gets stuck, believe it or not, that anterior arch actually protrudes forward in the rear of the throat and actually cause food to actually physically get stuck. So it's just, just a little piece of trivia right there. Looking down the spinal column, you see the dens, you see the position or everything. Now we're talking about other diagnostic situations. The hyoid bone itself is pretty much dependent on the amount of clenching that you physically do. So the higher, the more you clench, the higher the hyoid bone is going to sit and the more it tends to retrude. And when it retrudes, it'll actually obstruct your breathing, okay? Now the elevator muscles, if you are a clencher, okay? The clencher actually activates all the muscles in your jaw, in your temporalis, the internal pterygoid, which is the angle of your jaw, and the external pterygoid, which wriggles your jaw. And basically what happens is those will actually constrict. But there's a one more muscle that's attached to this, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, but elevator muscles, increased motion. You're gonna see the upper lip start to thin, the cupid's bow will go away, the jaw will actually start to become retro-inclined. In other words, the jaw will physically push back, and it'll cause the spasm of the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictor muscles. Now, those constrictor muscles, as we're going to see, actually start at the rear of the buccinator muscle and the anterior portion of the masseter, and actually goes all the way around the back of your throat. When you swallow, that's what constricts and puts the food down, the, down your throat. But what happens is those muscles actually adhere to the anterior portion of C1, 2, and 3. Okay, so that's part of the reason why when the jaw moves, the vertebrae will actually physically rotate, okay? One thing you're also gonna to see too is that uh, when a patient comes to you and they have an oral appliance, they've been to a doctor or a dentist, and they have an oral appliance, the thicker the appliance, the more it tends to make them clench. So that's a little piece of uh, trivia for you too. Forward head posture, we know about. Uh, when you're talking about cervical angulation, you're talking about normal angulation, and that's right at the base of the skull, right here. Normal angulation is 101 degrees, a straight spine is 90 degrees, and a capotic spine is 80 to 84 degrees when you're actually doing the measurements. Uh, torticollis, we all know about, and that primarily works at C6 and C7, it's further down in your neck. Um, and the upper cervical ligament evaluation, again, it's the yes ligament, no ligament, and the I don't know ligament, the transverse ALR and the uh, cruciate ligaments. And here are the kids, where they're located. Dysautonomia, I don't know if anybody pays any attention to this, but dysautonomia is a malfunction, if in fact, of the autonomic systems that we see in the body. Now, there's a few systems that will actually come together, and I'm gonna show you this in a minute, but proximate structures, uh, malfunctioning automatic systems, and POTS. Uh, POTS is one thing that we tend to see in the EDS patients. EDS patients have low uh, ability in their veins to actually return blood to their hearts. So what tends to happen is that the, the heart will increase, we have a brady, uh, tachycardia, and then blood is not actually sent back to the brain, so you have pooling of the blood in the legs, tachycardia, and you have people passing out. That's what they call positional orthostatic tachycardia. Pharyngeal constrictors. This is my superior pharyngeal constrictor. This is my big boy right here. Um, and the way the system works, believe it or not, and the reason I'm involved with it, is that the action of the superior pharyngeal constrictor actually starts right here in the middle of your chin. The mentalis muscle attaches to the ubicularis oris, attaches to the buccinator, and the superior pharyngeal constrictor starts at the fascia between the buccinator and the master. 
goes around the back of your throat, comes out the other side. Again, when it constricts, you swallow. This is a picture of it and how it's actually located. And middle pharyngeal constrictor is part of the player, but it basically goes from the hyoid bone to the basion, and it affects C4. What we're worried about is C1, 2, and 3. There's the middle pharyngeal constrictor. Now, there's another one of my favorite pictures. This is a horizontal section right through the jaw. And what you're looking at, these are the back teeth, this is your trachea, and this is the musculature of the superior pharyngeal constrictor, and this is the, ver the uh, vertebrae itself. But in this little area right here are a few structures. Guess what? Vagus nerve, GI problems, uh, erratic heart rate, erratic breathing, your accessory nerve, we were talking about that yesterday. We are talking about the hypoglossal nerve, your tongue, the sympathetic tr trunk, the ALR fascia from C2, from the rotation of the vertebrae, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and the internal carotid artery. All these structures are in that posterior velum. So when you have distortion of C1 or C2, the ALR ligament has actually rotated that. A lot of times you'll get um, the ancillary situation here. So one of the things that I do, believe it or not, I'll actually have the patient take and, and blow. This is like dizzy cholesterol, you just blow and actually distend the rear of that throat. When we do that, believe it or not, it'll actually stretch that fascia. And if somebody's sitting in my chair and they're nauseated, a lot of times that nausea will actually physically become less because of the lack of distortion of the vagus nerve. Now this is, my, this is my little thing that I came up with about two years ago, the cervical myofascial pain syndrome. Now, we're talking about the change of the mandible and it, its, its effect on the superior pharyngeal constrictor. So basically what happens is uh, on the cervical plane, it will tend to actually evolve C1 and C2 because of the attachments that we saw in the prior, uh, prior, uh, prior uh, slide. So when that happens, it'll actually cause a couple of things. Number one, the levator scapulae muscle goes from C2 to C7 underneath the medial portion of your shoulder blade. So a lot of times when you're standing in the sink and you get that sharp blade up underneath the shoulder blade, it's from actually rotation of C2. So that's one possible uh, area of discomfort that would you, you might have uh, attributed to Chiari. Now what also happens is the lateral tubercle of C1 will tend to track with C2. So that's where you'll get the area underneath the ear, the tenderness. And what happens is, is that C that lateral tubercle will actually push on the medial portion of the sternocleidomastoid. So you'll get pain down the side of your neck. Well, when C1 and C2 rotate, they'll actually get the longest coli, sore in the anterior portion of your neck. So you got longest coli, SCM, lateral tubercle. And that's all from rotation of C1 and C2. But keeping in mind, there's another one, the greater occipital nerve that gets compressed between C1 and C2. That nerve actually physically goes to the occipital muscle in the rear of your head, to the aponeurosis, to the front talus. Gosh, pain in the back, pain in the front, and then it also will compress V1, pain behind the eye. So you got pain from the occipital area to the, vo to the vertex to the frontalis and behind the eye. So when I'm actually trying to figure out which headache comes from where, if it starts here and ends up here, it's usually occipital and it's greater occipital neuralgia. If it's lateral, you can actually have the patient clench and you can actually feel the fasciculations and you can actually track that headache as per where it goes, okay? So basically, we're talking about chicken or the egg. Does the jaw cause the neck to go out, or does the neck cause the jaw to go out? Well, that's, that's sort of tough to figure out. But what you're going to find out is mandibular positional change induces the cervical change. Um, you get the area below the ear, behind the eye, uh, and you get the normal TMJ symptoms. Now, what, normal, what are normal TMJ symptoms? Pain over the joint, inability to open, Headaches in the temporalis muscle, 
spasms in the master muscle, pain in the back area of the joint, and sometimes a lancating pain into the joint. Lancating pain in the joint, usually there's a displacement. It's your external pterygoid muscle. If the pain is into the teeth or at the underneath the angle of the cheek, that's usually the masseter muscle, internal or external. If it's underneath the jaw or under the tongue, it's usually an internal pterygoid muscle. Um, so this is what we're talking about. PMJ and stability of C1 and C2 are, in my opinion, fairly integrated. And what tends to happen is, is that we've actually worked out a methodology as a PT motion to actually replace C1 and C2. And we have a, I have a couple of surgeons that I work with. Dr. Bolognese is one, Dr. Henderson is one. And we will actually try and rotate those vertebrae back into place and, man, and position the mandible before the surgery is done to number one, limit the cervical myofascial pain syndrome just because of the fact that if the fixation is done and those vertebrae are maintained in that place, all those symptoms will hang on. We're talking about underneath the levator. We're talking about the lateral portion of the neck and the discomfort over the top. So uh, especially with Dr. Henderson, I will actually position all those before he does the fixation. That's one. Number two, what we'll tend to do is actually we'll tend to limit it. And when I've, we've done a number of small children by actually repositioning the head posture, the neck posture, and actually eliminated the need for the surgery themselves. Not that I'm not, and I don't appreciate what you guys do, but uh, the one thing I found out is the more you can always do the surgery, you can't get it back, and we talked about that, okay? So from that point, do we have any questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any questions? Uh, I didn't get any uh, emails coming through. I wish you, if you have questions, put them through the Gmail question thing. Are there any questions? For, otherwise, we're going to move because we're running a little bit late, and I want Dr. Hafez is going to be the next speaker. Yes. How do you approach in stabilizing first the mandible and then the upper two vertebras you were saying? Is that what essentially? Well, the basic is procedure, but there's, a, there's actually an activation procedure we call a cervical muscle activation procedure where we actually use the inferior oblique on one side and the rectus capitis minor on the other. And I can actually physically rotate those vertebrae with the patient in the chair. So you're okay. rotating the vertebrae I'm to place. I'm rotating back and decompressing the uh, uh, the occipital nerve, number one, we're actually putting, when we do that, they'll actually come back into place and C1 will actually retract. They can actually breathe better. So, so if C1, C2 is being retracted back, so then you're seeing the head actually go on top of the spine, well, you're changing well, it, the forward head goes posture? On top of it, but that mandible will distort also. When the mandible comes back to position, what it does is it actually equalizes the superior pharyngeal constrictor and it will actually equalize the positioning of C1 and C2 again. So when the mandible goes back, the constrictors are stabilized, and what you're seeing, like facially, diagnostically, is the head positioning back on top of the spine. And you'll actually see the jaw come back to midline. And the jaw to the midline, <laughs> okay. That's a lot of fun stuff, it really is. But um, we've been doing this primarily for about 10 years, and this is just a product of what we've been doing for 10 years. Uh, we've been doing for TMJs for 40 plus years. And I started out with Michael Gilb's father and all those guys, you know. But uh, it's, um, it's interesting in the fact that the uh, position of the mandible will actually dictate the position of the upper cervical vertebrae and actually eliminate a lot of the symptoms, the occipital headaches, uh, the referral pain, the eye pressure behind the eyes, the lateral head pain. It will actually eliminate that. And sometimes it actually can eliminate the amount of surgeries that you have to do. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, maybe you'll be available if patients want to ask some questions uh, after right. the session. <laughs>